Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at another dual uh, DDR4 dual rank Samsung B die memory overclock on a Z690 motherboard. This time it's the Asus Z690 Tough Gaming. Bit of a weird story of how I got this board because basically what happened is somebody got in touch with me and asked if I'd be doing any Asus Z690 DDR4 con content, to which I replied no because I don't have any Z690 DDR4 Asus boards. And basically they just ended up buying the tough for me. So that's how I have one of these boards right now. So yeah, thank you to that individual for uh, funding the purchase of the board. Now let's take a look at what I've been able to get out of this G-Scale 3600CL14 kit on the Z690 Tough Gaming. Um, so also CPU is still the 12900K just on air cooling. There's a fan sitting on top of the memory sticks because I am pushing the memory voltage quite high for this overclock, though if you were willing to sacrifice the primary timings you could get away with significantly lower memory voltage. Um, anyway, um, yeah, let's take a look at it. So, uh, the mem so the overclock passed 600% mem test, it also passed 33 loops of Linpack, it runs Y-Cruncher, um, now, now it's going to crash. <laughs> No, no, it runs Y-Cruncher just fine. Um, so the purpose of Y-Cruncher and Linpack is they're both very good sort of like memory controller stress tests. Um, also, Y-Cruncher is just generally a pretty good uh, benchmark, in my opinion. And like stress test, like th that's kind of, that's also one of the reasons I like Linpack is you can just look at the gigaflops number as a decent indicator of, of memory performance. And Y-Cruncher is kind of similar in that sense. Um, and what's nice with Y-Cruncher, well, the thing is you wouldn't use Prime95 small FFTs for, for stress testing, so, um, not for memory stress testing, because that's like a CPU, uh, stress test, not a memory stress test. Um, anyway, yeah, so Y-Cruncher works. Uh, I've also run IDA on this, um, so, which I didn't... Moving the mouse around while White Cruncher is running is probably going to drag the benchmark score down a bit. Um, though I'm not actually going to do that. Yeah, we're going to wait for it to run through. What's kind of funny about the White Cruncher score here is this is actually faster than uh, DDR4, DDR5. Go to go away, Windows. D then DDR5. Okay, yeah. So me me messing around with the mouse wasn't helping, but. Um, this is, so previously it was like at 77.2 seconds. Also, I think just having all this stuff open at the same time is not ideal. Um, but, uh, this is actually slightly faster than DDR5 5400 with auto sub timings. Now, admittedly, DDR5 5400 with auto sub timings is trash, but it's still just kind of funny how, like, yeah, you don't really, like, for all that, uh, effective memory speed, it really doesn't deliver, like, because this is basically a throughput benchmark. It does care about memory latency somewhat, but this is primarily a throughput benchmark similar to Linpack. And so this is one of the places where you'd really expect DDR5 to have a huge advantage, but, like, on auto settings, it just doesn't, because auto settings are trash. All, pretty much universally. So, because, yeah, anyway, um... So for IDA, we have 64.6 gigabytes per second read, 60 gigabyte, uh, 60 and a half gigabytes write, and 68 gigabytes per second copy, all of which are completely just violating the theoretical maximum uh, memory bandwidth because this is currently running at 3,900 megabits per second. It's a dual channel, you know, memory configuration. So uh, the max memory bandwidth off the top of my head, I want to say is 62.4 gigabytes per second. So both the copy test and the read test are evidently hitting the caches of the CPU quite a lot because, yeah, that's one of the issues with like any kind of synthetic memory benchmark like this is especially if you're trying to actually measure memory bandwidth. You can't just ask the memory controller, hey, Mr. Memory Controller, how much data is, you know, moving through you. It doesn't work like that. Um, and so the end result is basically every synthetic memory test accidentally ends up pulling data from the cache. And that skews your memory read and write and, like, copy results upwards because you're not actually accessing the memory, you're accessing the caches. Um... But yeah, um, anyway, so that's just kind of like, so if, you, if you're ever wondering why it's possible to get IDA64 
like bandwidth numbers that violate the physical capabilities of the memory, um, that's why. It's it's because it's actually measuring, uh, like it's mixing in cache access to the overall memory benchmark. Anyway, latency at 45.0 uh, nanoseconds. I've also, with these settings, seen it sometimes do like 44.8. Um, and also sometimes go all the way up to like 46 nanoseconds. So I think actually probably even past that if I rerun it right now. But uh, yeah, don't like from as far as I can tell for DDR4, this is pretty decent. Okay, so we got a 45.2 right now. The thing is I have the e-cores turned off, which is partially so I can get Linpack to run and that kind of thing, um, as well as Y-Cruncher to run. Uh, also, the CPU is down at 4.8 gigahertz core, but with 4.6 gigahertz ring, um, and the fact that the E cores are turned off actually helps the latency test a bit because I think sometimes the latency test accidentally ends up on the E cores and then the latency just goes straight to hell because um, the the E cores are are they're they're just bad. <laughs> like there the, there's a reason they're called efficiency cores and not you know performance cores because the performance isn't there. Um, Anyway, so yeah, in terms of performance, I'm like pleased with this. Um, and now I guess let's take a look at the settings. So if you want to check your memory timings on uh, Asus motherboards in Windows, the easiest way you can do that uh, is with uh, just memtweak it. Um, hopefully I'll remember to put a link to this program somewhere in the description. Um, but if I don't, you can find it on the hardware bot forums. Um, it might be even on some official Asus download page. I'm not sure. I got it from the hardware bot forums. Um, and yeah, anyway, um, apparently my TRP is at 13. I don't, did I seriously do that? I might've done that. Oh yeah, I did do that. Cool. <laughs> Okay, so we're at 14, 15, 13. Yeah, which is part of why the, the memory voltage is so high that, you know, I have a fan sitting directly on the memory sticks. Um, but yeah, so, so MemTweakit is great for set, checking your memory settings uh, in the OS. But now let's restart and take a look at the BIOS settings because at the very least they'll be, you know, the numbers will be bigger, so more legible in a YouTube video. Um, Man, Windows is really taking its time to restart. <laughs> okay, there we go. I was kind of getting tempted to just hit the reset button on that. Oh man, this board. This board is so annoying with that. Like I've maxed out the boot up delay in the BIOS and it's still like, I very regularly miss the BIOS. <laughs> it's infuriating. Like this is the only board that I've ever run into, like run into this problem with. I guess everybody else's motherboards boot up so slowly that this isn't an issue, but yeah, I like, I'm, I'm serious. Like I've maxed out the boot delay if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, see, it's completely maxed out. Actually, no, it goes up to 10 seconds. Well, it was, isn't helping. <laughs> It isn't helping. It still managed to miss the boot up. Anyway, so we're at 3,900 megabits per second. Um, I guess let's go over the voltages first. Yeah, so ring is at 4.6. Uh, core voltage at 1.28, mostly because we're on the air cooler. If I wasn't on the air cooler, I'd be pushing the CPU to around, around 5.1 with 4.8 ring, but air cooler, so 2.8. Um, Anyway, system agent all the way down at 1.2 volts. Interestingly enough, the system agent voltage does seem to have a very, like it does roll over. Um, and for me, that really seems to start happening already at like 1.35-ish volts or even 1.3 volts. Like I was having serious trouble with getting Memtest to pass until I dropped the uh, system agent voltage all the way down to like 1.23. And now even at 1.22 volts, it's it's just passing just fine not really having any stability issues with it. Though, interestingly enough, the system agent voltage does seem to play a bit of a role in terms of what max ring clock you can run. So if I wasn't on the air cooler, I wonder how that would work out. Like if I was trying to do 4.8 ring, maybe I would have ended up with more system agent voltage than what I'm at right now. But at least the memory at like dual rank 3900 megabits per second, it doesn't need a ton of system agent voltage at these settings. Um, and really, at like past I th like past one point three, I was having serious stability issues. So, 
um, which were showing up really late into memtest, mind you. Like, it wasn't like it was immediately causing errors. It was like I couldn't get like a 400% pass. Um, like, it just wouldn't do that. So, yeah, anyway, um, memory voltage were all the way up at 1.6 volts because this is a 3600 CL14 kit at 1.45 volts for XMP. So to get it with slightly tighter primary timings all the way up to 3900 megabits per second, it did, does need quite a bit of voltage. This is maybe a little bit excessive. I'm not concerned about like the health of the memory controller uh, or the health of the memory sticks with 1.6 volts. The main concern with this much memory voltage, especially on something like Samsung BDI, is that it ends up being extremely temperature sensitive, which is why we have the fan, right? Like if you were actually setting this kind of overclock up in a case, I would be very concerned about the heat output of your GPU. Um, cause the RAM itself does not produce a lot of heat. <laughs> so the bigger concern is everything around the RAM heating up the RAM. And so, yeah, though, honestly at 1.6 volts, even the RAM is going to get kind of warm if you don't have, you know, great airflow. Um, but if you have like a high, like a big power hungry GPU, then you probably actually want to run your memory stress test at the same time as I hate recommending Furmark, but Furmark is really good at not loading your CPU too much. The The thing is, I don't like Furmark because it's it's not like, it, it's bad for your, it's bad for GPUs as far as I'm concerned. Like, it's not something I would generally recommend using, but I can't really think of, because most other stress, most other GPU stress tests use so much CPU that they'll end up actually stut like they they'll stutter and slow down if you're also running a memory test at the same time. So, yeah, I'm not really sure what else you could use to like load your GPU up to to keep like get um loaded operating temperatures instead of like idle operating temperatures for your system internals. But of course, you know, for me it's not like I personally don't care. I run open air test benches. I don't have to worry about where the heat from my GPU goes cuz it just goes straight into the room not onto my, you know, and doesn't get trapped inside a box, cooking everything in said box. Anyway, uh, below that we have the IVR transmitter VDDQ voltage, which, if I'm not mistaken, is supposed to be called VDD2, but this has to be the second motherboard that I, like, Gigabyte also does this. Like, this, the, the thing is, so this voltage, if you try to look it up in the Intel documentation for LGA1700, doesn't exist. Um, and... Based on the description, it says, you know, sets the voltage for the internal transmitter voltage of the memory for the memory controller. I can only assume that means the VDD2 voltage because there's no other voltage in the Intel documentation that's referred to as being for the memory controller. So I'm assuming that's VDD2 and Asus just had to come up with a very creative name for it. Anyway, that's that's fine all the way up at 1.5 volts. I'm actually really not sure what the upper limit for this is, but it should be similar to like upper limits for your actual memory voltage itself. Um, I would assume at least. But um, yeah, like that that voltage. Um, I'm not concerned with 1.5, but I'm not sure if I would necessarily want to go much higher. Also. Uh, I think it might I might be running it a little bit higher than necessary. As in, like, probably 1.4 would have also passed mem test, but the, the thing is, is just, uh, I mean, it passed, and at this point, I'm, I'm happy with it. Actually, does it ever turn red? No, it doesn't. Okay, so I suspect this is, this is very much a case of, like, you can run it at basically whatever. Though, if it's generated by the integrated voltage regulator, you shouldn't be able to run it at higher voltages than the actual CPU input voltage, so, um, anyway, I guess for day-to-day -day operation, you should, like, I wouldn't, be setting it above 1.5 volts you also shouldn't need to so yeah anyway uh oh yeah speaking of other things that asus likes to relabel um we have this setting over here called memory controller to dram frequency ratio um which if you i'm pretty sure if we go into windows right now and i show you cpu z <laughs> Is, is not going to make any sense. Because um, it says 39, well, whatever. So th that's the gear mode, right? So, and th this is another thing, like Intel in their own official documentation calls it gear. Like the register for what this setting controls is called gear mode. 
Um, so the, all the Intel documentation talks about gear one, gear two, gear four, right? Which is one, one to one, one to two, one to four. Um, and then there's Asus where, because they're Asus, they had to come up with a whole new name for it because just using the standard naming conventions is just like below them or something. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's part of why I'm not a fan of just like Asus BIOS is the, the renaming of absolutely everything. To be fair, when it comes to voltages like the IVR transmitter VDDQ voltage, I don't think I've seen a single motherboard refer to that voltage by its proper name, so I, I'll give them a pass on that. But everybody else just uses gear mode, and then there's Asus where it's like, no, 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 we we need to come up with a better name for it than gear mode because like it's just just too sensible. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, and so if you're on DDR4, you definitely want to be in one-to-one -one mode. Um, at least for dual rank memory setups, you really should want to be in one-to-one -one mode because uh, in two-to-one mode, you get a bunch of extra memory latency. This is actually a big part of why DDR5 has so much memory latency is because it's impossible to run DDR5 in one-to-one. -one. Um, so yeah, one-to-one -one for DDR4, one-to-two for DDR5, and one-to-four is, uh, let's just not talk about one-to-four. One like I'm not entirely sure why, why that setting exists. It's like, if you want your RAM to underperform massively, I guess that's what it's for. Actually, no, it's good for like max frequency validations, but not much else. Um, actually, I'm not even sure it's used for max frequency validations. But yeah, like for actual, like with DDR4, if you're going for performance, you want to use gear one or as Asus calls it, one-to-one -one mode. Um, anyway, let's take a look at the actual timings. So primaries, 14, 15, 13. Uh, this is a big part of why I'm all the way at 1.6 volts on the memory voltage. If I was running, say, 15, 16... Actually, 13 would probably still work. Um, but yeah, if I was running cast latency 15 and TRCD 16, then the kit should be able to do that with 1.5 volts instead of 1.6. But, uh, you know, I kind of wanted to push uh, the limits of what would be reasonable for daily here. And so, yeah, 1.6 it is. Um... So yeah, do RAS to act time at 28. Uh, command rate. Um, so interesting. This is a big difference between the Tough and the Gigabyte board. The Gigabyte board does 1T at 3600 megabits per second and then doesn't train past 3600 megabits per second regardless of what you do. This, on the other hand, uh, doesn't train 1T at 3600, me me uh, 3600 megabits per second. Uh, it also doesn't train it anywhere else. As like if you try to use 1N, it just doesn't work. Um, maybe at some very low frequencies it might, but I'm not sure how low you'd have to go because it, like running less than 3600 megabits per second, in my opinion, is just kind of like, like it's not worth it. Like it is just not worth it to go that low in order to get one one end command rate. Um, so yeah, that that's that's a weird thing. I'm assuming Asus will eventually put out a BIOS patch for that because on older DDR4 platforms, they actually had really good one one T command rate support. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm really surprised that like it needs to be at two ticks on Z690 because historically, if anything, I would have expected the Gigabyte board to be weak in the com command rate department, but no. Um, yeah, the, the tough evidently, like, I can't get 1T to train. Like, it's not even like, oh, it's not stable. It's just like, it will not post currently. So I'm assuming that eventually they'll, like, that'll maybe get fixed or maybe it won't. In which case, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I still need to get an MSI motherboard in for comparison. I've seen some very impressive screenshots off of MSI boards with, like, 1T command rate working all the way up at, like, 4200 on dual rank. Um... But with with this, I've I've not seen equivalents for Asus boards yet. So yeah. Anyway, um, then we have our RRD timings. So five four, which is pretty standard. Actually, four four would have probably worked as well. But um, yeah, it doesn't really make that much of a performance difference. Uh, TRFC is a two eighty. Then we have TREFI at forty thousand. Write recovery time at eleven, which actually ends up being ten in the OS, which. Yeah, I'm not entirely, like, this is a thing that Asus boards do. I don't know why. Um, there's, there's a, like, there's an explanation for it. I've just never bothered to look into it. So, um, yeah, it doesn't really concern me too much. Um, but, uh, 
yeah, anyway, so that, that ends up being 10 once we get into the OS, and that just works just fine. Uh, RTP is 6, 4 active window is 16. Uh, these timings over here, you, you shouldn't really have to set them, or, like, you shouldn't even set them, because these are all, like, the write-to-read delays. Those are all derived from your tertiary timings, and so I just, like, there's no point setting those, as far as I'm concerned. Um, on Intel platforms. On AMD platforms, they work very differently, but on Intel platforms, they're based off of the tertiaries, so you should just set your tertiaries and leave these on auto, because that'll, like, they'll automatically get configured to match your tertiary timings. Um, anyway, uh, then we have TCKE, which I don't believe goes, oh, I guess it does go below 4. I need to check the Intel documentation for that, because I think for Z, Z590, it bottomed out at 4. Um, so maybe it goes lower now, but too late. <laughs> like, I've only just found out, so it's a bit unfortunate. DRAM write latency is 16. Though, no, actually, wait a minute. I wonder if Asus is just not handling... Okay, they're just not handling minimum values. Because you can't set the R R like the RRD timings, you cannot set them below 4. The, the memory controller just doesn't support you... Doesn't support values that low. Um, you try to set something below 4... I. Well, maybe three will work, but you shouldn't be able to set it to one. And so the fact that I can punch in one there doesn't actually mean that it's possible to set it to one. Um, anyway, then we have our tertiary timings. So uh, read to read, same group. Oh, and this is another one of those things that I just find mild. Th uh, this is mildly annoying compared to the random relabeling of everything out of everything from Asus. This this isn't quite so bad. But they reorder their tertiary timings compared to literally every other manufacturer. So what Asus does is they group their tertiary timings by same group and different group first. So you have like read to read, same group, read to read, different group. Then you have read to write, same group, read to uh, write, different group. Read, uh, write to write, same group, write to write, different group. Uh, you know, you get the idea. Then you have like write to read, same group, write to read, different group. And then you get all the different rank, different dim timings, which like the way everybody else does it is you have all of your read to reads together, and then you have all of your read to writes together, and then you have all of your writes to writes together, and then you have all of your read write to write to read timings. That's like how Asus, I mean, that's how ASRock, Gigabyte, MSI all have them laid out. And then there's Asus where they reorder them, which makes sense if you're on like a single rank memory setup, because if you're on single rank, all of the different rank and different dim timings, like these do not apply to you. You could basically, like they do not matter. The memory controller isn't using them because there physically isn't a different rank or a different dim. But um, this is a dual rank setup. <laughs> and so like one of the things I had to like, yeah, so this is just one of those things that just kind of frustrates me is like, oh, I, I need to actually, because I'm, I'm used to just sort of setting them as like a, a pattern of like 7, 4, 7, 7, 12, 12, 12, 12, 7, 4, 7, 7. And, and then you get to an Asus board and it's like, oh, that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I need to read the damn timings now. Anyway, but standard Samsung BDI tertiary timings, we've got 7, 4, 12, 12, 7, 4, 28, 24. And then we just have basically all... Uh, read to writes are 12 and then everything else is just sevens um, for the different rank and different dim timings. Now technically, you know, we do only have two memory sticks here so I shouldn't actually have to set the different dim timings but I just set them to the same value as the different rank timing because it's more aesthetically pleasing than having like auto values in between. Also, I think on, I think it was Z590 where there was a bug that the different dim, va like the order of the timings got switched around, which if that's still the case, then this avoids that. But even if you were running four memory sticks, you should be able to set your different rank and different dim timings to the exact same values. So there's just like, in my opinion, there's just no reason not to set them all to the same thing. Um, right, like technically, I should only need to set like every other one, but that that's just horrible to look at. So seven, 12, seven, 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 there, um, much nicer. Um, and um, yeah, so that's basically it for the memory overclocking on the top, at least with this dual rank Samsung B die kit. Um, with single rank memory sticks, one T command rate works just fine. Higher uh, memory speeds are also possible. Um, but the thing is, single rank is, 
Well, I've not tested Micron single rank. The thing is, like, I don't know why you would want a 12th gen CPU and then limit yourself to 16 gigs of RAM. Like, that just seems like a really weird uh, hardware combination to have, like, a 12th gen chip and then 16 gigs of RAM. It's not unusable, but it's just kind of weird. I think if you're getting a 12th gen chip, you probably want to get 32 gigs of RAM, in which case you should probably be looking at either dual rank Samsung v die or uh, maybe single rank Micron memory chips. And I've not yet tested single rank Micron on this, so that'll be interesting because it might actually make sense to run that in gear two, um, or as Asus calls it, one to two ratio. Um, but uh, yeah, um, for, for dual rank at least, like this is certainly a lot better than the Gigabyte board currently. Um, I think if Gigabyte ever sorts out their DDR4 BIOS, then they might actually end up having an advantage because the 1T command rate just works on the Gigabyte board. So if, if that behavior of 1T command rate working, you know, held up to like maybe, I don't know, 3,900 megabits per second, that would just be a win for Gigabyte in that case. Um, if they get the frequency to go even higher than that, then it's even more of a win, but you know, like... I'm not sure how soon we'll see bi like you know BIOS updates for Gigabyte DDR4 boards addressing the actual memory overclocking. So I don't know when that'll happen, if it'll ever happen, right? Like there's a small, there is certainly a chance that they might never uh, get the the memory overclocking to be on par with uh, Asus. So yeah, but currently like this is, um, I I'd say this is fine. Like, I wouldn't, wouldn't be too annoyed with this for daily. Um, so, yeah. That's kind of it for this video. So, I guess, thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comments section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the HOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. Both Patreon and Teespring help out immensely with running the channel, so it'd be much appreciated if you'd check them out. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it for the video, so thank you for watching, and goodbye!